so good morning, everyone. At least it's like it's still morning for me. Um, we were out partying last night for very long. It was awesome. So if you missed it, it's your fault. Um, my talk is going to be about monitoring and logging and doing that in real time. Because I think it's, in many web applications, a very important thing to monitor how a web application is behaving when it's put into production and also to be able to see what's happening there and why an error occurred to it to go back if, and debug something and fix something. And it's oftentimes overlooked. And a lot of people have their web applications in production, but accessing logs, monitoring stuff, is kind of the thing you do probably think about only when it's already in production and way too late when all the errors happening. So the next 45 minutes or so will be about monitoring and logging. Um, logging, of course, it will start with logging is if you have an error in your application, you want to be able to check it's really down and monitoring, as I said, measuring what is happening in the application, why it's behaving like that, how, what are users doing, and maybe finding out stuff because of that. Of course, with, like with many, many things, there are a lot of tools out there that help you and lots of ways to do this. It's like a bit dependent on your web applications, on your use cases. I will just highlight like a few tools, a few things that worked in our company. Um, Depending on what application you have, you probably end up using other tools. The important thing to take away from this talk is actually care about monitoring and logging stuff because it really, really helps you. Before we start with that, a few words about me. I work at a company called ResearchGate. It's a social network for scientists, and we try to accelerate the scientific progress by really helping researchers doing their research and supporting them in building up their reputation online. And publishing something, we have over 2.9 million users um, and still growing. So like we have problems putting new servers on all the time, which is a really nice thing. That's what a profile looks like. We have like very famous investors. And if you want to read up on that, there are links. And I'll publish the slides later on. I, we are also hiring people. So if you want to play table tennis or football or something, uh, we have a careers page. Or just talk to me afterwards. And if I'm not working there, I'll oftentimes speak at conferences like this because you can travel, you can meet people, you can be in sunny Bézier, which or Bézier is, is really nice, and I work and live in Berlin. If you have any question in this talk, just raise your hands. We are not that many people. We are good on time. And if I'm speaking too fast, because people tend to tell me I'm speaking, too f speaking very fast, also just raise your hand. If you didn't understand something, it's probably my fault because of my weird accent. And um, no worries. If you want to know more about something or if I should go into detail or something, we have time in the end or just in between. So logging for when something goes wrong in an application. If we look at logging on a naive approach or just what kind of logs our normal application produces, it's, oh, first of all, um, who is doing um, mostly back end? Who is doing mostly front end? OK, half, half. I'm doing both, actually. Um, so front end, probably JavaScript. Um, back end, who is using uh, Python? One, two, Ruby, PHP, Java. OK, so good mixture. The thing is, this is important for everything. And I also have no really code example or anything. Um, we're just talking about web applications. So a normal web application produces something like this. It produces some access logs from your web server that you see automatically what records are coming in. It produces error logs with exceptions, stack traces, autom mostly automatically. Um, if you didn't turn it off. And maybe your application also locks some debug information automatically, like, for example, Postgres or MySQL queries that it's doing, and cache access, and routing of your application, and so on. It depends really. And of course, your database and everything also may have logs, like a slow query log. Depends a bit on the database solution. If we go on, if you want to access these logs, like the most easy approach is just SSH into the server and then use your favorite Unix command line tools if you have a Windows server. I don't know. <coughs> don't ask me how you SSH in a Windows server. Um, that works. If you have one server, that's great. And if we look at more details of what, about what is in the log, of course, error logs are really, really important. If there's an exception out there, it's probably in your error log, so you should monitor them. Um, in Apache, you can configure where it is, but it's not that important. One thing you always should do is really not present the users with a nice error message and not show him stack traces. So have something like this. 
And there are actually a few very, very important details in this screenshot here. First of all, this number. Because if you are having an exception, it happens. You should really also put out a uh, nice and really good error code, like a 503 or something that is really related to your error. This is actually very important also for, also for caches, because otherwise caches would probably, if you cache this error page and think it's the, or proxies would cache this, would cache this error page, was thinking, okay, this is like the real, real page. Also, it's important for Google, because when Google sees an HTTP response code 200, it thinks it's the content and doesn't know that it's actually an error page. So it's something you really should look into, and especially PHP oftentimes just returns an HTTP 200 by default, even if there is an exception happening. Um, then, um, yeah, here link to read up on response codes. Then the next thing that's here is this error codes and correlation ID. I'll come back to correlation ID and what that is a bit later, but it's very, very useful to actually generate some kind of error code that you also lock with your exception, so that if you get a screenshot or maybe copy and paste it in the email from a user, something, hey, I got this error page, something didn't work, that you actually can track down the exception that caused this error page. So this is something very, very useful. And when you're at it and adding new additional information like uh, this error code here to your exception, you can actually think about, I could add way more information <coughs> to my logs to make it even easier and better to pinpoint why this exception happened. So you can lock additional information with it. Um, so not only error codes, but also, for example, information about the request or the session of the user. So what you can do is add the request URL, the HTTP method of the request, the user agent, the, all the request headers, the referrer, the session ID, account ID, anonymized IP address of the user, everything that can help you track down the error and make it as easy as possible to debug it. Next thing that happens automatically is an access log. So probably everyone has seen something like this. And there you can do the same thing. You can add additional information to your access log. Also to make it as easy as possible to pinpoint what happened. For example, uh, in Apache you can just, or in Nginx, who's using Apache? Who's using Nginx? Okay, we're using both for some, we're getting rid of Apache though. Um, the usual way to add additional information to your access log, because you can't access this directly because it's written by your web server, is just to have a few response headers um, that you put out in your application with additional information like the session ID or account ID that you want to have in the access logs. Uh, and then, like in Apache, you can do this with this access log format in Nginx is very, very similar. Of course, you probably should filter them out with like some rules so that they don't get transported to the user. Um, and also, this, having this information in Excel is really, really useful. Maybe not for tracking down errors, but if you want to like, validate some metrics you are collecting or something. For example, how many logins you had. Then it's very useful to have this information in Excel log, so that you can actually, if worse comes to worse, you can get the access log and use grab and some stuff and find an AWK to actually analyze them and validate the numbers that really, really happened. If you are unsure if your monitoring was correct. And Last type of logs that happen in your web application are debug logs. So, and there you can really go crazy. You can, with debug logs, log really everything that can help you track down what happened in your request in your application. Um, for example, if you have an exception somewhere in your model layer, it's probably very useful to have a log on what database queries were went before then. Maybe it's because the exception was because some data was invalid and you only see that if you actually see the queries. Um, one thing is, if you really are go crazy with logging, first thing is you really should not care about, like 10 years ago, people said, okay, you should probably turn off logging in production because it generates a huge amount of data and um, all this disk space that it's using, but who cares? This space is very, very cheap. I don't know, probably your web server has way more of this space than it needs for your web application. And of course, you probably are not collecting logs for like uh, for months. You probably throw them away after a week or something, or 10 days, it depends how it is. And then it's very useful to really have lots of logging. But still, if you log every database request, every memcache access and everything, it somehow will generate lots of lots of logs if you do it for every request. On the, and on the other hand, 
you're actually only interested in these logs if something happened in the request, if there was an error in it. And 95 or 99% of the requests are just fine and you're just not interested in this, all this data, probably. So what you can do and what you could, should, should look into in your application, something like a fingers crossed handler. Most logging frameworks like Monolog or Log4j actually support them or you can just write them yourself. The way they work is you push all your log messages from your application into this, your debug log messages into this handler this handler stores it, and only if a certain condition is met, for example, an exception was thrown, it then flushes all these logs to actually the disk to a file. And that way you only have all this detailed logging when you actually need it, when an error was there. Um, yeah, very easy concept, concept, but reduces the amount of logs you're writing tremendously. Of course, it has a li slight memory overhead because you're collecting all these logs in memory, <laughs> but Normally, this also, also should be fine. Depends a bit on your application, of course. One thing you also then, if you're collecting all this information, should think about, uh, you should think log in an actually structured way. Somehow. Better? Okay. Um, because logging in a structured way actually really, really helps you with analyzing the logs later on. Uh, one way to do this is, a good way to do this is JSON because it's good tooling and support in every language. And in that way, you don't have to think about parsing that much later on. Like if you have a custom log format somewhere in one line, you have to parse it later on and this is really annoying. In JSON, you can just put it into, uh, because everyone, every language has to, like, a JSON library, you just put it into your JSON library and have it in a structured way and can access the additional information you log to it very, very easily. But uh, normal web applications are actually a bit more complicated than just having one server. Lots of times you have uh, some ZOA architectures or something, and then your application more looks like this. You have the user requests coming in there, um, there you have a, well, well, your main web application, and then you have some underlying services you access through HTTP. And all these services also generate logs. So oftentimes something could happen that an exception was thrown here, and then you're presenting an error to the user in your application layer, but it's actually very hard to track down what exception caused the error here. One way to make this easier and to correlate the different logs happening in all these different services is to create a tracing or correlation ID. What is that? So when your request first comes in from the user, you generate a unique request ID, just like a random unique ID, for this request, and this ID you also lock with every log message you put into anywhere, and you can also transport this log message over a request header, for example, to every underlying service that also locks this ID. And in that way, you can just like search for this correlation ID, and then get all the logs, access log, all the error logs from all applications, all the debug logs from all applications for this one request. And this is a, a really, really powerful if you have a service-oriented architecture to really track down over different services all the errors. So this would be, could be like some of these request headers. But oftentimes, your application does not look only look like this, that you have like one web server and a few services on other servers. It looks more like this. You have multiple servers. Who has more than one server? <sighs> Most. And I said earlier, yeah, it's very easy to get other logs because you can just SSH into your server, use t tail and grab and cut and AWK for it. But if you have 10, 15, 20, 50 servers, it more looks like this. And yeah, you know, there is DSH and everything that makes it a bit easier to have multiple sessions to a service, but this can get really, really annoying and confusing. So it's very, very useful to aggregate the logs in a central place. Also, if you, have, if you have more than a couple developers, it's probably that not everybody has access to a production service, which is a good thing. But everybody should probably be able to look at the logs and be able to track down errors. And you don't want to only have all the developers who are assigned to a bug ticket or anything go to the sysops all the time and say, hey, I need these log messages. Oh, no, that was not the right one. I need other log messages. And this is also doesn't scale very well. So it makes sense to aggregate logs in a central place. Who does central log management? Okay. Um, I will describe a bit what central log management is, and hopefully after this talk, everyone is 
going back to the company and saying, okay, we need central log management, we have to think about it. And we want to have it in a central place, we want to have it easy, full text searchable, we want to have all the logs aggregated in one pay place, and we want to have a cool solution. But one thing that is really, really important when you're doing all that, you sh still should, as a backup, log to file. Because central log management is cool and awesome, but it will fail at some point. It probably will fail at that point when you really, really need it. So you really should log to file. Seriously, log to a file. When we think about central log management, the easiest approach of it, the most naive approach, is just in your request, put all the log messages into a database. So I have all my application servers, and each time I'm logging something, I'm doing a SQL insert or MongoDB insert or something, and put it into my database. There are some disadvantages. Oh, thank you very much. Um, there are some disadvantages of the solution. First thing is, what happens if the database is down? I'm losing log messages. I'm ha not having it anymore. What is when the database is slow? I'm actually slowing down my request for the user just because my log logging database is slow or not reachable. What if it's, is it full? Also, that could influence application performance, which is really bad because it's logging. It's not something. It's something that should help me, but it should not hurt me and should not make my request slower. Also, how to integrate logs in that, like access logs that are actually written over from the web server or log query logs that are written from the database, where I don't have any influence about what's in there and how is it written. And yeah, the most important thing is it influences or badly influences application performance, especially if you um, have really go crazy with debug logging and put lots of logs in there, it could mean like 50, 100 inserts per request. It's like probably not something that is really, really useful to do. Also, if you log it to a database, you still don't have a nice front end for it. Um, of course, there are stuff like uh, RockMongo, PG Admin, and all the small web front ends or front end tools for databases, but they're not made for actually analyzing and searching logs. They're just custom front-end tools for the database. So uh, also, it's not easily searchable in most databases. Like, OK, you can do a like query with, my SQL, with SQL or something, but it's not, it's not really full text search. So are there better solutions? There are multiple. I'll just highlight one, because that's the solutions we are using at ResearchGate. For us, it works well. For you, it may not. And just look what's out there. and test it and pick what's working best for you. So what we're using is a software called Greylock 2. I actually don't know if there's even a Greylock 1. But, um, and Greylock 2 is a very, very nice tool for uh, easily having logs there, making them full text searchable. It understands structured message. It ba basically understands JSON. And also supports metrics and alarms on your messages. So that you can s say, OK, I have a certain threshold of log messages, and if it gets more, if I get more log messages in, probably more exceptions or something, I get an email notification, which is also very useful. That's what the interface is looking like, and I will also demo it later so that you can see it a bit more in a bit better resolution. One thing, if you want to try it out, it's very easy because I built up a virtual vagrant machine for you. So you can just go to GitHub later on, I'll publish the slides and link to them, and you can just check it out and Put up, pull up the Vagrant virtual machine and try it out, which makes it very easy. So you should do that. With Greylock, the most naive approach to use it is saying, OK, I have my web servers, and each time I'm logging something, I'm actually sending a request to Greylock with a GALF message, a grand Greylock extended log format message. And Greylock then does a bit of analyzing it, and in the end, uses Elasticsearch as a backend and as a storage for all these log messages to make them easily full text searchable. Um, also has some disadvantages. First, a uh, GALF gray log extended log format message is JSON, which is very nice. There are some fields in there, like a message, uh, the time, a timestamp that are mandatory, or facility, or file and line, and you can add any other kind of fields and to it, like a user ID or something else. So we can really, go and all the fields are then indexed and full text searchable. But there are still disadvantages. On this. What is gray log or elastic searches down? What is it full? Also, UDP requests, I have packet loss with that. And still, I'm 
influencing my application performance because I'm sending out requests over network. With UDP, okay, it's a bit fire and forget, so it's probably not too bad, but still opening a socket, pushing stuff on a socket. And with TCP requests, it will actually, I would wait for it. I would wait for the request actually to be finished. Also, um, if probably my, I will not only have like one server or two servers dedicated for logging, what happens if really, really something bad happens, I have lots of exception, chances are that probably I'm losing lots of exception because Greylog and Elasticsearch are not fast enough to index it that fast. So first thing is you sh probably should put kind of a load balancing for log message in it. Um, easiest solution there is just use RabbitMQ, another AMQP server for load balancing, so that your applications would just push the log messages to AMQP. AMQP is very scalable and very made for, okay, caching all the messages and then let Greylock listen on it, and Greylock supports AMQP very well, so that's actually the preferred setup to do this. But still, it's in the end the same thing. I still have a request from my web servers, from my application, from my actual user request, to this MQP server and influencing my application performance. Remember, I said always log to file. Anyways, so we are logging to file as a backup, and why can't we just like use the files as a data source? And there comes in another very, very handy small tool called Logstash. Um, Logstash is a small daemon that you can just install on your server and run on your server. It has a very low memory footprint, so it should be fine. And it basically works like this, that it has some inputs, plugins, where you can get data in. For example, the input would be the file. You can have, do some filtering on it, some parsing, for example, par having a JSON parser in there. It's already supported. And you have output plugins where you push the logs somewhere else, for example, to MQP. The plugin system is very rich, so probably for every form and everything, there's already any, everything in there. And the setup then would look like this. I have my web servers. They are writing logs to a file, which is fast, and wouldn't, won't influence our application for performance very much. And then we have logstash instances running on every server that just tail on the file, passes them, and send then send the JSON message, the resulting JSON message, to AMQP. And then um, Greylock listens on AMQP on RabbitMQ and puts it into Elasticsearch. Also, so this is actually very, very flexible and fast to handle lots of lots of log messages. Um, and then, of course, you can scale it horizontally and at this layer and at this layer and at this layer, and you should be able to really scale this solution very well. That's logging. Who's not excited about doing that, something like that? Nobody. Come on. Okay, one, Nicholas, thank you very much. Second thing is, uh, second part of the talk is monitoring. That is actually probably as important as finding out why errors happened, because this is actually monitoring what, how your application is behaving and finding out what are you using, how you can improve it. First thing with monitoring is that you have technical metrics. So technical metrics are server load, request per second, exceptions per second, of course, uh, memory usage, CPU usage, all the stuff that you know, need to know to de determine if your systems, if your servers are healthy or, or if they are overloaded. Also response time, I'll come back to response time a bit later. Average response time of a is also very interesting if it goes down, down and your request gets lower, so you probably have a performance problem, so you need more servers or uh, you need to optimize your database or something. But even more important than these technical metrics are business metrics. So key performance indicators, like business people say. And that could be, it's totally dependent on your application. That could be sign-ups per second. That could be average size of the shopping basket or average amount of order. Um, that could be uploaded images, profiles, follows, sent messages, sent emails. Really, this really depends on your application. And it's really important to define them and also monitor them constantly. Because what you can do then is you say, okay, we have these 10, 15, 20 different, very diff important indicators, and you monitor them constantly in real time. And if you deploy something, a new, a new version of your um, application, 
then you can just monitor, okay, are these indicators going down? Maybe it's not an exception that's causing that, but maybe I'm just probably removed accidentally the follow button on some page, or um, I hit it too well so that nobody does it anymore or something. And you can really see this then instantly that something that is important for you is going down, or maybe also going up, that's a nice thing. But if it's going down, you can say, okay, we need to rework that, we need to put a bit more effort into that, we have to maybe roll back and um, see if it works. And like, you can even go a bit more crazy. Is there's a company called Booking.com in Amsterdam, and what they're doing, they have metrics for everything that is really important for them. And when they deploy something, they instantly see, okay, if they instantly see, okay, that didn't work for us, it gets rolled back. They also have ex make acceptation on features, so they're saying, okay, we are building this feature. We want that this feature will increase probably uh, the time spent on site by 5%, and if that doesn't do it after deployment, they just roll back the features going out. So they are very, very good with doing and using these performance indicators. Um, tooling for that, that can help you. One I really like is Graphite. It's basically your web servers, every time you're counting something or you're measuring something, you're sending a small request to Graphite, and Graphite then automatically counts and it aggregates all these numbers and gives you nice graphs out of that. Um, one way to scale this a bit better, because if you're really monitoring lots of stuff, it, it could be that you're having like 50, 100 requests or something, or small counter requests, is actually to use a daemon between that called statsd. So you're actually sending all your metrics, all your counters to statsd, statsd aggregates that, and then every 10 seconds or 15 seconds, depends how you configure it, flushes the data. It was one request to Graphite, so that Graphite doesn't get overloaded by if you have like 10, 15 servers pushing data all the time there. And of course, you can also scale this with having a statsd locally on every web server, which makes sense, because then from your application, it's only one request over localhost, and you even can have a stats D in between that and really scale this in a tree, which is also very useful. What kind of metrics are supported there? Of course, counters. So each time something happens, I'm doing plus one, plus one, or plus two, or plus five. <coughs> and I'm counting that and seeing then the amount of counts per second in my graphs. There are also timers. How long did something happen or did something take? And then you have automatically have the average, the upper 90, lower 90, and uh, timers for that. And there are, uh, I forgot how to pronounce this again, GORGs or something, um, which are just arbitrary metrics. Could be, for example, the value in your shopping cart, how many euro a user spent. And then you also get an average about these numbers. Like, this is how it looks like on the front end. So it's, the front is not that nice. You have, it's built on, up on XJS, but it's very powerful. You can aggregate different metrics and graphs together, do different mathematical functions on it. And it has a very nice API, so you also can get the data out there again. And a very, very useful tool. If you want, don't want to set it up yourself, you also, there are tons of hosted platforms and service providers that do that. For example, Librato is one. Of course, they have to pay for it. For, like, I don't know, 0 0.00001 cent or per metric per increment, but it adds up. So it's probably very good to get started with it. And at one point when you're saying, okay, I'm paying too much for it, so it's actually uh, way, way, way cheaper to set up a server myself, set up Graphite myself, and you can just exchange it. Because the setup with Librato is the same, in but instead of just pushing it to Graphite, you're pushing it somewhere else. Of course, you also have to trust them that what they are doing with your metrics because they know shit about very much, very much about your business and so you should trust them. And in some companies, it's probably not as not so good to push important metrics to an external company, other company. What you also should do then is if you have all these metrics, make them as accessible for n at least every full-time employee because in like very, very nice dashboards, this is a picture of, Ad, of the office of Etsy. I always want to take a picture of our office because we have also these nice screens on there, but I always forget this. I'm sorry. Um, so, of course, you shouldn't go overboard and put all the metrics in there, but the important one you should put on there so it's really, really visible for everyone if something goes wrong or also if something goes right. So it's a good motivational thing. Um, and while you're at it, you also can then 
add your continuous integration monitor on there. Um, maybe a Twitter stream, how often your company is mentioned, something like that. Actually, also being mentioned on Twitter is a good metric, more of a technical metric, because uh, if something goes wrong, Twitter is probably faster, with <laughs> or people on Twitter are faster with that complaining than you could actually see it in your error logs. Um, and while you are at it and monitoring all this stuff, one thing you really, even if you say, okay, all this, what this crazy German is telling you is like, is like business metrics, I think that's not important for me. One thing you should monitor is response time. Because this is one of the most important and most overlooked metrics. And also one, if you do start doing it, measuring response time, is something that is really, really, really painful to look at. Because you are probably slower than you expect it to be. And the easiest approach of logging response time is just to get it out of the access log. Like, I have the response time in my access log automatically. But is this time here that I spend on my request actually the, something that we want to measure? Because if I took 882 milliseconds to serve the request, it doesn't mean, uh, say that the page is visible for the user and the user can use it, because there's lots of stuff that can happen. There are slow connections, there is DNS resolving, there are slow browsers, there are lots of external resources, images, JavaScript, CSS, uh, that you are, it gets added up on that, the whole transport over the internet. And if your servers are somewhere in the United States or in Europe and uh, some user from China comes to your page, it's, it's gonna actually going to be very slow and uh, it's an additional few hundred milliseconds that got, uh, it's because of transporting. I also have mobile connections, so mobile connections are also kind of slow. You have SSL handshakes and actually you want to take all that in account because you want to measure what your user is experien experiencing and not only what your server is experiencing. What your server is experiencing is also like, important, but what your user is experiencing, how fast it is for the IM, it's actually, that's the thing we want to measure. A nice tool for doing that is called Boomerang. Basically what it does is it makes use of uh, some JavaScript APIs that gives you a lot of information, timing information about your request, that support, that which is supported in WebKit browsers, uh, Firefox, and IE10, and Opera. So. Uh, it has good support, and it falls back to some more, okay, I'm making a timestamp now when uh, my request first arrives, and I'm making a timestamp on the server, and I'm making a timestamp on um, on the end of the request after all the on-road handlers fired. But it hides all that for you, so it's very, very useful. And the way it works is just some JavaScript that you add to your request, and this JavaScript tracks all the timing, and then it issues a tracking request to some tracking image, of course, that you have to implement in your server, and it puts all the time information as query parameters in there. And what you can then do is just configure your web server to have a zero byte response, 200 response or something, maybe with an image header, and do nothing else, but the request with all the query parameters is then in the access log, and what you then can do is just put another log session on it, which tails on this access log, parses the access log, parses out all the query parameters, and then you can c say to Logsash, okay, put this data, put, put this measuring information to statsd as timers, and statsd can then push it to graphite and have nice timing information about your requests. You don't have to program anything, you're just configuring and using the tools you may be using already anyways. So this is something which is very, very quickly to set up. And I said I wanted to show you a bit about that. Um, yeah, maybe everybody can see that. So I said I had like this virtual machine thing here set up. So I'm running it at the moment with Greylog. Um, let me just put a few log messages in it. And yeah, it's good to see it, see it in the back. Thank you. Um, so what I have here is a stream of all my log messages coming in. I can re like reload it. I have some nice graphs where I see how many log messages are going to go there. I can here I have spike for some reason, so I actually can only look at the log messages in this range. I can, uh, of course, search to through it. Uh, hang on. So I can just search through it, full text, through all the messages. 
uh, and run it. So here I have some test message in there. I can, of course, click on it, see all the details. Uh, every field, these are like different fields. Every field is also like searchable again, so I can search for all log messages with this value, for example, which is very nice. Um, I can have streams. For example, here I have a stream with all log messages where there is this current MQ size in there and can look at this. I can put alarms on it and get email notifications if I want to. Um, and this is really, really useful. In the back end, it's just Elasticsearch, so your data is not really locked in into Greylock. You can just like use put queries onto Elasticsearch if you want to more, do more complicated queries on an analysis on that. But this interface is um, really, really powerful on its own. And when you are then there with that, you can actually go even a bit more crazy with all this information. You have all this information. You can put it in much more detail, actually also visible for your developers. Um, I'll just put this up a bit because otherwise it's not really visible because it's, a, it's very low. Um, what we decided to do is we have all this log information, debug information already, and we want to make it visible really to all developers. So we added like a small toolbar, which is very similar to the Symfony toolbar, toolbar and uses lots of Symfony code which lots of, with lots of debug information or that we are collecting and we're just displaying it not to use but to developers so they directly see what's happening in, in our application. For example, here, very nice, is the response time, which was really, really fast, 279 milliseconds. And then, of course, we can also dive down into it and see what really happened there and where the 279 milliseconds happened. For example, we see that we spent 152 milliseconds fetching data for this projects page um, and this is really useful to track down performance problems as well and uses leverages lots of the log data we're already collecting. Um, of course, um, you can also then see all the HTTP requests. I can't show that, unfortunately. Um, so we are collecting all of them, all the responses, all the queries and session information and how long something took. And this is also really useful to really put it in everybody's face and say, okay, performance is important, see what's happening there, and you can't, as a developer, hide from that one, from this toolbar. So it's also something worth investing a few hours into. And it doesn't take so long to set something like this up. Um, so I hope I got you a bit excited about monitoring and logging, because it's not uh, the most sexiest thing in the world in the beginning. But it really pays off to invest time in that. And you will be amazed how quick you'll be in finding out why a bug happened and fixing errors. And um, yeah, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and we have time for questions. Oh, yeah. Um, the question, like for the recording question was um, about log management. You can also use syslog. It works, yeah. So if it works for you, for us, this, uh, so the solution with Greylog and putting Elasticsearch was better. But also, Greylog can import directly from Syslog as well. So yeah, Syslog is also a good solution. As I said, there are many ways to do it. You just should do it. That was, yeah? Um, the question was, uh, if I tried to play with Kibana, you mean with, uh, on top of Elasticsearch, right? Oh yeah, um, no, I haven't. But it's also a valid solution. Um, the thing is that Greylog is really made for for the purpose of logging. So I have actually a lot of stuff for free in there that you don't have to set up in Kibana. You would need to set up dashboards. But it's also if it works for you, it's fine. So I'm not I have no preferences at all. I can't won't tell you. Okay, this one is way better than that one. It depends on the use case and what you have. So you can also have both. So it doesn't hurt as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question was, um, we are always, in our solutions, pushing data from the machines with the daemon to the central log management. And um, why don't we instead have a central log server that access every other source and pu uh, pulls the data from there? Um, just 
it scales for us better. Or it works for us better. Works for us good like this. It's um, also a better solution just to pull the data. Um, yeah, this for. Yeah, um, so it's all internal in our network, so we don't have any security considerations there. And it's basically just, of course, yeah, then the, all the servers know about that there's a central log management somewhere, so there's a queue where we push the logs into. But it's not the real application that knows it, it's only the daemon that knows this information, and we're pro we are using Puppet for, pub for provisioning all the servers anyway, so. Um, other way around is central log management would need to know about every server. And every time you add a server, you have to need, to add a con need to change the configuration of your central log management. And that way, if we add a server, we just uh, like push the data there. Also, it could be if some of the servers are not reachable, the configuration on your log servers with all the IP addresses or host names is then not reachable anymore. There could be like timeouts there, and then your log management, all this pulling of the logs gets slower and slower because some, some hosts are timing out. and this way we don't have this problem. But yeah, if it works for you as pulling, it's also a good approach. Yeah. Further questions? If not, I'll be around here for the reminder of the day. And I don't know, is there a social event tonight? Okay, I'll be there as well, as well hopefully. And um, if not, you always can like contact me, send me emails, reach me on Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook or something, and I'll upload the slides and tweet about them where they are. They are on speaker deck, but um, then you can also get the links and everything again. So thank you very much.